Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's forum on the current state of the United States government relationship to Saudi Arabia. In the light of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi's murder in tw October 2018, there's been an onslaught of criticism of both the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who allegedly ordered the assassination, and of the United States' continued alliance with Saudi Arabia. So we are joined today by Ambassador Robert Jordan and Brookings Institution Fellow Tamara kaufman Witties to discuss the intricacies of this relationship. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and our moderator today is Ian Masters. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones, and please note that taking photographs and recording video or audio are not permitted in the theater. However, we are videotaping this, and we'll make it available on the Hammer website soon, so if you want to share it with your friends and family, you'll be able to do so. I also want to mention a couple of upcoming Hammer programs you might be interested in. The next Hammer Forum is taking place on March 3rd. It's going to be focusing on gerrymandering in the state of North Carolina as a case study of sort of the most extreme forms of gerrymandering. And after we had planned this program, the Supreme Court just decided last week to take on the North Carolina gerrymandering case. So that's going to be one of the cases they're hearing this year. Um, also on March, March 19th, we have a Hammer Forum looking at the growing YIMBY movement, which is a yes in my backyard movement responding to the NIMBY movement. And that's also a big issue here in Los Angeles as well as California, Northern California and pretty much everywhere else. Um, also this Tuesday on February 5th, we have a program called Speaking Truth to Power from Thomas to Kavanaugh. And we will be screening a documentary film about Anita Hill's hearings. And then we have one of her legal team uh, professor, UCLA law professor Kimberly Crenshaw will be in dialogue with writer Rebecca Traster talking about parallels between the Anita Hill hearings and the um, Christine Blasey Ford hearings. So now on to today's program. I'm going to introduce our guest speakers and then we'll get started. And I should also note, sorry, that a uh, Q&A today will be on 3 by 5 cards and you should have all reach, uh, received a 3 by 5 card and a pencil on your way in. If you didn't, you can always raise your hand and an usher will bring one to you or if you need extras, they can bring them to you as well. Um, our first speaker is Ambassador Robert Jordan. He is a diplomat in residence and professor of practice in the Center for Political Studies at Southern Methodist, Methodist University. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 2001 to 2003. He took charge of his mission in the wake of the attacks of September 11th at a critical time in U.S.-Saudi relations during which he worked closely with President George W. Bush and senior government officials in maintaining the relationship with Saudi Arabia, combating terrorism, and promoting economic reform and human rights in the kingdom. He spearheaded American encouragement of the Saudi economic reforms necessary to qualify for accession to the World Trade Organization. He was a partner in the international law firm Baker Botts LLP for many years and headed the firm's Middle East practice based in Dubai until his retirement in 2014. He is the vice chair of the Tower Center Board of Directors and the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and is a member of the Board of Governors of the Middle East Institute and the Southwestern Medical Foundation. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a past president of the Dallas Bar Association. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Center for American and International Law and also serves on the advisory board of the bilateral U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce. He's a frequent commentator in the media, including CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and the New York Times. His memoir is called Desert Diplomat, Inside Saudi Arabia Following 9-11. It was published in 2011, and we have copies for sale in the lobby after this program if you'd like to purchase one. Our second panelist is Tamara kaufman Witties. She's a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute. Witties served as the United States Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from November 2009 to January 2012, where she coordinated the U.S. policy on democracy and human rights in the Middle East and during the Arab uprisings. She also oversaw the Middle East Partnership Initiative and served as Deputy Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions. Woody's is a co-host of the weekly podcast, Rational Security, which covers foreign policy and national security issues. She also writes on U.S. Middle East policy, regional conflict and conflict resolution, the challenges of global democracy, and the future of Arab governance. 
Her current research is for a forthcoming book, Our SOBs, on the Tangled History of America's Ties to Autocratic Allies. Witte's joined the Brookings Institute in December 2003. Previously, she served as a Middle East Specialist at the U.S. Institute of Peace and as the Director of Programs at the Middle East Institute in Washington. She's also taught courses in international relations and security studies at Georgetown University. She's the author of the book, Freedom's Unsteady March, America's Role in Building Arab Democracy. And she's editor of How Israelis and Palestinians Negotiate, a cross-cultural analysis of the Oslo peace process, published in 2005. She serves on the board of the National Democratic Institute, as well as on the advisory board of the Israel Institute, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Women in International Security. Our moderator, Ian Masters, is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 30 years on public radio. He's the host of the nationally syndicated news analysis radio program, Background Briefing, heard locally on KPFK 90.7 FM. He's produced documentaries for ABC News and Frontline, and has been a senior fellow at UCLA's Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations, and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So now please join me in welcoming Ian Masters, Tamara Wittes, and Ambassador Robert Jordan. Thank you, football fans, for coming today. <laughs> We're the pregame show, right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. We're the Womack. I have an Womack. announcement before we start. Uh -huh. uh, the Rams are going to win. Uh, <laughs> I come from Dallas, and the gorilla in the Dallas Zoo has predicted that the Rams will win. Uh, and the gorilla has been correct in three of the last four Super Bowls. There you go. So let's begin the discussion with you, Ambassador Jordan, since you were there in Saudi Arabia after 9-11. And you met with the then governor of Riyadh, who is now the king, King Salman. And uh, you asked him or mentioned to him or <laughs> questioned him about the fact that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. So walk us through his response and, and, and the encounter in general. Sure. I, I arrived in October of 2001, so it's about a month after 9-11. And I'm trying to figure out if the Saudis are friend or foe, so I went to see uh, the governor of Riyadh and asked him this question. And his, he looked at me, and his response was, oh, no, 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 there were no Saudis involved in this whatsoever. This was an Israeli plot, plotted by the Mossad to draw, drive a wedge between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Well, I couldn't really believe my ears, uh, I then went on uh, a day or two later to see the Minister of Interior, Prince Nayef, and I asked him the same question, and I got the same answer. It was a Mossad plot. Finally, I was able to meet with uh, the Saudi Foreign Minister, Prince Saud al-Faisal, uh, the son of the late King Faisal. Uh, Prince Saud was a Princeton graduate. Uh, he spoke better English than I did. Uh, and he got it, he understood they had an extremism problem in their midst, they had to do something about it, and they very much needed our help. But I think, that, I think Salman and Nayef simply couldn't grapple with a way to answer because they had never been held accountable on the world stage before. They simply didn't know what to say. And Tamara, what, what do you make of the President Trump's response? He's acted as a uh, Mohammed bin Salman is Saudi Arabia, as opposed to Saudi Arabia. We have relations with Saudi Arabia, the U.S. and, Saudi, and they're longstanding, etc. But the way that he frames it is almost like uh, it's 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 uh, Mohammed bin Salman or nothing. When there's there's a whole cadre of people there. How many princes have they got? Thousands, you know. So that's my puzzlement about it: is that how come it, it, that somebody hasn't sort of pointed out to the president that there's more to Saudi Arabia than Mohammed bin Salman. And if he's stuck his neck out to the extent that he has, President Trump, what's he getting in return? I mean, do, do you think there's some transaction? We know he's a transactional guy, and we know the Saudis are transactional. So it's almost like, is this a family-to-family -family relation or a country-to-country -country relationship we're talking about here? Well, I, I think it's an excellent question. I'm not sure we know the full answer. Um, 
but I, I think that there, look, there are some pragmatic reasons um, for the focus on Mohammed bin Salman. You're right that there are several thousand Saudi princes, uh, but the United States does not get to decide which of them will rule. The Saudi royal family decides that, and at least for now, uh, Mohammed bin But not the Saudi people. Uh, but not the Saudi people. And, uh, and so for now, Mohammed bin Salman has engineered a centralization of power in his own hands. His father is aged and not entirely uh, in control of his faculties, reports are. Uh, and so this young man, for better or worse, is ruling the country in a more direct, personal manner than any Saudi monarch in modern times, probably since the founder, since... Um, and so that's the reality we face. Now, of course, the United States, like every other country in the world, has interests. It, has, it doesn't have permanent friends or enemies. It has permanent interests, as we say. And, and that is true of the Saudis as well. And the relationship that we have had over 70-odd years is rooted in some shared interests. But the world changes, the region changes, the United States changes, and we have to constantly examine how congruent our interests are and what that means for our relationship. For better or worse, this guy is probably going to be running the kingdom for the foreseeable future. So given that he has run it in such a way that has um, revealed uh, what I would say a lack of prudent judgment on a number of issues, uh, whether it's... Um, inserting Saudi forces into a civil war in Yemen, uh, whether it's forcing kidnapping and forcing the resignation of the Lebanese prime minister, uh, or the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi and, uh, and pretty harsh pursuit of dissenters both at home and abroad. You know, th these raise reasonable questions about his judgment. And so that's a conversation that has to happen between our government and their government where we say, look, if we're gonna rely on you to work together on these shared interests, we have to be able to rely on your judgment and these things that we see trouble us. Uh, I, you know, I don't exclude the possibility that in having that conversation, we can have some influence, but I think we need to be very clear eyed about how much influence we can have. And Ambassador Jordan, when, when we hear that the, uh, Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who I think will be soon to be king, but um, and we can talk about that. Uh, he's apparently very popular. That's what we hear, and we're told that you know don't push the envelope. It's a laborious and difficult task he has. He's got tremendous conservative backlash from the clerics. He's trying to rein them in. So give the guy some breathing space uh, and that he's a reformer, we can talk about that too. <laughs> so let's start with that. Is, it, is this an excuse for a lack of uh, democratic reforms or reforms in general, or is he really that popular? Well, he appears to be popular partly, I think, because the Saudi media machine has manipulated uh, his popularity. Uh, starting with uh, the war in Yemen, uh, they portrayed him on billboards uh, throughout the country in battle fatigues. Uh, they portrayed him commanding uh, tanks and aircraft and so forth uh, during the early days of the war when it appeared that it would be over rather quickly. I'm not so sure they're doing that quite so much anymore. Uh, and I think his ownership of that war is something they are not touting quite as heavily now. He has seized on something that is really important, though, and that is the need for economic reform in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and to eliminate corruption. But what, what he has done is to manipulate that need uh, into a means of consolidating his power as well. So, for example, in November of 2017, uh, we saw the spectacle of hundreds and hundreds of royals and senior business people from all over the kingdom being rounded up and incarcerated in the Ritz Carlton. Uh, some of them were tortured, abused. There was a general who apparently was killed in the midst of all of this. Uh, and so I think we should not uh, think uh, that this guy is some uh, reformer on a white horse uh, taking charge of uh, an economy and a state uh, that needs uh, his 
his fingerprints all over it in quite this same way. He's using the existence of corruption. He's using the existence of economic uh, issues uh, for his own personal gain. And so I think you've got to say it's a mixed bag. I think these interests have converged in a way. But while he is talking about reform, he's talking about allowing women to drive. He has, has allowed them to drive since last June. Uh, he's bringing cinema movies uh, into the kingdom, uh, emphasizing tourism. But what he is not doing is emphasizing any kind of political reform. That is a red line that he will not allow to be addressed. May I add just a couple notes to that? I, I, I couldn't agree more with that analysis of uh, the crown prince as using economic reform as uh, a foundation on which to consolidate his own power. Uh, and I think part of the challenge he faces is that he's trying to centralize what had been a very diffuse uh, and, and corrupt, I mean, it is a patron-client system. Um, he's trying to centralize that around him. So he needs to build new foundations for his own power while he's destroying the traditional foundations of Saudi royal power. Uh, and he's trying to do that using nationalism and using PR campaigns and, and uh, theme parks and concerts and Mariah Carey and all this other stuff. Um, and I, look, this, this society, this, the, the people, the 22 million or so Saudis, are primarily young. Half this population is under the age of majority, okay? It's an amazingly young country. And so there are a lot of young people who grew up seeing octogenarian monarchs running their lives. And there is something fresh and exciting about a 32-year-old crown prince who is closer to their own perspective, who understands the internet and understands satellite TV and understands that young people have aspirations to go out and have fun. Um, but I think we, we need to recognize that he really is trying to trade off some of that um, social connection, if you will, and he's saying, okay, I'll, I'll give you concerts and I'll give you theme parks and I'll give you movie theaters, just pipe down and let me decide what to do. So that it's an authoritarian bargain, basically. I'll give you more fun, but you have to uh, not dissent and don't demand things. And so at the same time that he allowed women to drive, he arrested the women who had been agitating and protesting and asking for the right to drive. And the message there is very clear. When changes come, they come from me. There and isn't such a thing demand. as rights. Yeah, there are yeah. no rights. They're simply privileges that he grants. Right. Yeah. So in that context, what did you make of Tom Friedman and the other members of the Western press who were they gullible? It looks like they were. Well, I think there is a long tradition in the United States of, um, of calling new Saudi rulers reformist modernizers. Uh, the, uh, an academic colleague of mine, a, a historian, actually put together a long Twitter thread of clips from the New York Times dating all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century New York Times stories labeling one Saudi after another as a modernizer or a reformer. So this, this is an American narrative that goes way back. And, and it's not unique to our relationship with Saudi Arabia, by the way. We see this in the way Americans talked about Pervez Musharraf when he sees power in Pakistan. Same thing. Um, it's almost as though when, when we decide that a given autocrat is somebody we need uh, because of our interests, we want to feel better about it. And so we tell ourselves a story uh, about modernizers. And we, because we're Americans, we assume that free markets uh, and free society and free speech and civil liberties all go together. And that if you do economic reform, political liberalization is going to come along with that. So we assume all these good things go together, and they don't in a lot of places around the world. And, and to his credit, Tom Friedman finally walked back his gushy piece uh, about <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman, but it did take quite a while. Yes, it, it took quite a while, and, and he pushed back hard against criticism, uh, including on the stage of the Brookings Institution. Right, but we should remember that he enabled liberals to back the Iraq war 
with his support for that. So there's some consistency there. Um, let's let's go back to the. I mean, one of the stories that I've heard, and and correct me if I'm wrong, it strikes me of how interesting politics are, in as much as they're really driven by personalities. We think of it in terms of nation states, but often it's personalities. The my understanding is that in the 1930s, a bunch of engineers from Southern California, Chevron out here in California, were in the Saudi Arabian desert firing off explosives for seismic testing. They were caught by the tribesmen. They were taken to Ibn Saud's royal court, and his translator was this eccentric Englishman, Harry St. John Philby, whose son, Kim Philby, was incredibly damaging to the West uh, as Russia's spy throughout the Cold War. My sense is that what the son took away, the father gave in spades because he was basically, once they realised, they, initially I thought they thought that he was, they were looking for water. They were. And they thought that, we want water. But then they said it's oil. And they, then he gave him a lease and gave him permission to, to search. And then, of course, they hit this incredible bonanza. Uh, then they had the choice. Do we give the concessions to the Americans or to the British, who we have long-standing relationships with? And it was Harry St. John's Philby's advice to give the concessions to the Americans because they will just have commercial relations only and they won't tell you how to run your place, whereas the Brits will eventually expect you to have a parliament. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, well, it's, it's largely true, I think, although uh, there were subsequent events that I think played a larger role. Okay. Um, the concession was a minor concession to start with, uh, and uh, there then was, on Valentine's Day of uh, 1945, a meeting between Franklin Roosevelt and King Abdulaziz Ibn Saud uh, aboard the USS Quincy uh, in the Great Bitter Lake of the Suez Canal. And that was really where they defined the relationship with a little more granularity. And again, the Brits were... were arguing that they needed to have uh, more access to the oil and, and a larger concession. Uh, but Abdulaziz ended up going with the Americans. Uh, and part of the lore of this story is that Churchill uh, went to see uh, King Abdulaziz right after Roosevelt's visit. Roosevelt, of course, was in a wheelchair, and when they met on the deck of the USS Quincy, uh, King uh, Abdulaziz was also limping and infirm. And Roosevelt gave him his spare wheelchair uh, to ride in. Uh, and Churchill came uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, was consuming vast amounts of whiskey during the uh, conversations uh, with the Muslim leader. Uh, and uh, Churchill then offered uh, King Abdulaziz a Rolls Royce. And he delivered the Rolls Royce. And the Rolls Royce, of course, in the British uh, system, uh, the, the steering wheel is on the right, and so the passenger rides on the left. Well, that is not a place of honor in the protocol uh, of many countries, including Saudi Arabia, and so Abel Disease felt that he was being diminished by being shoved off to the left. It also didn't hurt that the Americans offered a DC-3 airplane uh, uh, in their mix, and so the Americans ended up winning the bidding war, I think out of a sense of culture, uh, in a sense that uh, the Americans had never really been a colonial power, uh, the Brits had, and regardless of whether they would ultimately want a parliament, I think that was really a deciding factor. Well, the other big story is the compact between the Saudi royal family and the Wahhabis. So can you walk us through the history a little bit in the way that we, we got the history of oil? <laughs> Sure. So the, the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia is basically an expansion of uh, a, an enclave controlled by uh, Abdulaziz ibn Saud um, at the beginning of the century. And he was able to come back um, in the, I think in the late 20s, uh, from an exile in Kuwait. Uh, and uh, reconquer the, the central part of the Arabian Peninsula, his ancestral uh, lands, and then expand um, by allying himself with other tribes on the peninsula uh, and ultimately um, gain control of the entire peninsula and establish what they call the Third Kingdom 
uh, of, of the Al Saud, the third Saudi Arabia, which is the modern Saudi Arabia. And he was able to do this in part by allying himself with um, uh, a, a school of thought which um, is now called Wahhabi, although Saudis will say, well, there's no such thing as a Wahhabi, um, which is an extremely austere interpretation of Sunni Islam. Uh, and the al-Sheikh family, the main uh, clerical family associated with the school and their allies, became the partners of the al Saud in establishing the kingdom. So the kingdom was established through military force and through the sort of religious legitimacy bestowed by this, uh, this um, school of religious interpretation. It is the official uh, religious interpretation of the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom's criminal code, for example, uh, some of it is codified, a lot of it is not. It grows out of these religious rulings. Um, this is the, re the religion uh, as it is taught in Saudi schools. Um, it is, uh, and it is this austere um, interpretation of Islam uh, on which Osama bin Laden was raised. Uh, a number of Arabs from all over the region who came to, set to the kingdom to work when the kingdom was in its boom days of the 50s and 60s, uh, including Muslim Brotherhood who came from Egypt during repression there, picked up these ideas, brought them back home, uh, and the, this ideology became the seed of a whole bunch of smaller radical Islamist movements around the region, including what ultimately became the Egyptian Islamic group and Al Qaeda. Um, now, those radical organizations then turned on the governments, including the kingdom itself. Uh, their religious view or their ideological view is that these rulers are not in fact ruling according to the tenets of this uh, religious viewpoint, and therefore are religiously illegitimate and need to be fought against and overturned. So in a way, this, um, this religious stream gave spawn to some monsters that came back to bite it. And there's no question that the kingdom today, uh, in government, in policy, uh, quite sincerely, is resolutely opposed. Uh, to the the extremist violent movements that have emerged out of it. But the being the custodians of the shrines, Mecca and Medina, that gives this, the Saudi royal family legitimacy. And my understanding is before the modern state was formed in 1932, there was tremendous religious diversity in Mecca and Medina. And, and what happened to that? Well, uh, the, the Grand Mosque in Mecca uh, in those early days uh, was kind of like Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, you had a wide variety of religious uh, interpretations being represented. You had uh, a great deal of culture, but that was pretty much wiped out uh, once the kingdom was established in 1932 uh, and the uh, Wahhabi clerics were co-opted into this uh, Faustian bargain uh, with the royal family. And so they were simply... Uh, uh, eliminated uh, piece by piece, and the Wahhabi interpretation uh, extended. Uh, it, it extended so far that um, uh, there were even uprisings against uh, the royal family uh, emanating uh, from there. In 1979, uh, extremists took over the, the Grand Mosque in Mecca. The Saudis were uh, unable to figure out quite what to do, and so they hired some French mercenaries to come in and, and wipe them out. Uh, this, by the way, was the same year as the uh, Iranian Revolution. Uh, and the Saudis took from this the notion that they needed to be uh, more uh, pious, more religious, and wrap themselves even more strongly in this Wahhabi form of Islam. But it's led to, for example, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that, for example, Muhammad's wife essentially financed the religion in its early days. She was a businesswoman. Right. Her house was torn down, and I think there's a urinal there now and something. The, uh, the, this Wahhabi form of Islam is very much against any kind of icons or shrines of any sort. And so m 
much of the antiquities in Saudi Arabia don't exist anymore because they have been torn down uh, as a sign of disrespect for anything that co could constitute idolatry. So even, for example, the Prophet's birthday, which is celebrated in much of the Muslim world as a holiday, is disallowed as a holiday in Saudi Arabia because it's seen as a pathway toward veneration of the, of the Prophet rather than of the religion. So back, back to the earlier discussion about the compact. and uh, So we've, we've established, and it's hardly a secret, that the country's very repressive politically. There are no rights. Literally, the, there's no parliament, there's nothing. There's just the, the king, and in this case, his son. And then you've got this very austere religion. Is this, uh, is this, this may be the cynical interpretation, but <laughs> it's my interpretation. If you are so oppressed by a religion that you simply can't show a wisp of hair, uh, and you have the religious police, the mutawa, out there whipping you in the malls if you have whatever, you know, show an ankle or something. Doesn't, isn't that rather like the argument over, that a lot of women have about abortion is if the, if the government controls your, your body, they control your life. So is that what's going on there? In other words, if you have that, that much religious oppression, you can't think about revolution or democracy. <laughs> you can only worry about the Matawi coming and whipping you. So I, I guess a couple of things. One is I don't want to, I don't want folks to have the impression that this is a country frozen in time, frozen in the Middle Ages. I mean, yes, it is a monarchy. Uh, it does not have a constitution. Um, it, a lot of its laws, as I said, are not fully codified. Uh, and but it is not uh, a country that has never reformed. Um, the way these rules get interpreted shift over time, okay? The, the guardianship laws that relate to women's inability to travel or um, enroll in school or get a bank account or, or medical attention without the permission of their male guardian, these were codified by the Saudi state, okay? Some, some uh, communities in the country had that as part of their tradition, some did not. The state decided to make it the law. Um, today, the kingdom has municipal councils that are elected and elected by men and women, and men and women can sit on them in principle. Uh, that's new. That was a reform undertaken by King Abdullah, even though he was almost 90. So this is, it, it's, the kingdom can change, and it has changed in many, many ways. Um, so that's the first thing. But the second thing is, I think because of oil wealth, because uh, the kingdom was able to go in a couple of generations from subsistence living to a fairly high stage of development with a cradle to grave welfare system, you now have, as I said, half the country are young people who are healthy, more or less well-educated, but certainly far better educated than their than earlier generations, more aware of the world, more connected, and have aspirations for themselves, for their communities, for their country that are bigger. Uh, and so their expectations of their leadership are higher. And that creates a pressure of its own that I don't think we can ignore. So, you know, I, I was in the kingdom twice last year. On one visit, I was talking to some young women, recent university graduates who were doing internships. One young woman was from a fairly progressive family, and as a result, her parents, she grew up in another city, and her parents let her move to Riyadh on her own and get, got her an apartment so she could take an internship and live by herself, which is pretty radical. But that's her immediate family. The extended family is far more conservative. And so if they knew that she was living on her own in an apartment in Riyadh, that might not be so great. This is how people are trying to navigate in these very constrained circumstances. And the, the final thing I'll leave you with is that whenever you have publicly legislated morality, as you were saying about abortion, um, but you see it in, in the kingdom, you also see it in the Islamic Republic of Iran, by the way, 
Okay, publicly, I'm required in Iran to cover my hair and not have a wisp of hair showing, and there are guys out there with the power of the state to enforce that. But as soon as I go inside my apartment and shut the door, I'm going to do whatever I can get away with. Because the more you let enforce public morality, the more people go behind their own walls and gates and live the way they want to live. So it doesn't necessarily produce piety. It produces public performance of piety. Well, let's talk about a couple of the stories that are in the news, uh, rather different uh, versions of, of the Saudi government, in effect, in the sense that there's this young woman that was on her way to Australia with a kind of network of Saudi dissidents run by an artist. Uh, she was stopped at the airport in uh, Bangkok. Her, her passport was confiscated. She obviously was very savvy with social media. She got uh, Amnesty International in and she at one point barricaded herself in a hotel room. They were doing a lot of uh, real-time uh, uh, social media and eventually she was freed and she showed great courage. Uh, Raha, I think was her name. Mm -hmm. Then you have the stories now coming out in the Oregonian, which are just really disgraceful, of at least four Saudi students, not all at once, but over the, a while, Two uh, in jail for hit and run, one for uh, kitty porn, and the other one, I think, for manslaughter, or something, I think it was. One of them, I think one of the guys that killed the 15-year-old girl uh, was had an ankle bracelet. He was about to go to, to, to be sentenced. They cut the ankle bracelet, a big black SUV pulled up into the back of it, out to a private airfield, onto a jet, private jet, and obviously back in the kingdom. So what's going on here? Obviously there was some state sponsorship and help in, in the sure. regard of the exfiltration of that guy, but in terms of the arrest of the girl in, in um, Bangkok, there was also a state role where they grabbed her off the plane. So do they have agents abroad looking at their, at their students? They have agents abroad looking at students and looking at Saudi citizens uh, living abroad like uh, Jamal Khashoggi. And uh, they are taking extreme measures now to uh, round up and render uh, many of these back to Saudi Arabia, uh, some of whom uh, have not been heard from again. Uh, in the Oregonian case, I actually talked with that reporter a couple of days ago and uh, t told her that this is not surprising also that the Saudis will exfiltrate uh, their citizens from time to time. Any Saudi who is arrested in the United States immediately gets the assistance of the Saudi embassy. And they provide legal counsel, uh, they cover the expenses, and they are uncritical in their approach to guilt or innocence uh, in these cases. Uh, when I was ambassador, I also had a number of cases of Saudi men uh, kidnapping their children uh, when they were married to an American woman, kidnap kidnapping their children, violating court uh, custody decrees, and taking them back to Saudi with the assistance of the embassy and providing uh, fake passports and transportation. So uh, this is not a new thing. I think it's something that uh, we need to continue to monitor and very much need to ventilate through uh, journalism and, and, uh, and public uh, comment. And since... Jamal Khashoggi. Khashoggi's name was brought up. You knew him, did you know? I, I think we both did. Yeah, we both yeah. did. <laughs> so tell us about him, and then we'll talk a little about what happened to him. Not that we don't know, but as I said earlier, you know, the president really stuck his neck out for him, and I'm wondering what kind of transaction is going on there. So Jamal was a journalist in Saudi Arabia for many years. You knew him when you were there. I met him first in the kingdom um, when I first came to the kingdom as a scholar. I think for any uh, Western scholar who was working on uh, Saudi issues and came to visit the kingdom, he was a, an interpreter for us of Saudi politics, Saudi culture, Saudi society. Um, and, and, so, and he also mentored a generation of Saudi journalists. Uh, and was very well known in the journalistic community across the Arab world and very well respected. Um, he, uh, he fell afoul of the powers that be more than once for um, pushing 
boundaries as an editor. Uh, lost his job at a couple of uh, at one newspaper twice, I think, uh, doing that, and ultimately ended up working for uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal, uh, who was then our ambassador in Washington, or he, he was, was in, in London. London. London first. He was in London, and so Jamal worked for him um, essentially as a diplomat. Uh, for a little while, and then was going to start a new satellite television channel that was going to be based in Bahrain, and uh, did this shortly after the Arab uprisings. This television channel uh, was on air for m maybe 10 minutes, I think, because in the first show, uh, Jamal interviewed some Bahrainis who were uh, not exactly on the party line with the ruling monarchy of the Kingdom of Bahrain. And so that got shut down. So Jamal was somebody who was committed to uh, free speech <laughs> and, and I think showed that throughout his career. He came to Washington, um, I guess it was the late summer of 2017, uh, because he had finally concluded that he could not do that. He could not speak and write freely in the kingdom anymore. He was increasingly concerned for himself and for his kids who were there, uh, although grown. And I saw him shortly after he got to Washington. And he, um, I've worked on democracy and human rights in the Arab world for more than a decade now, and I, I know many brave activists and exiles. And Jamal had become an unwilling exile from his own country. And he shed tears the first time I saw him when he told me about his decision to leave. Um, he found a, a, a place with the Washington Post and continued to write very freely, and I think the, the the rulers of the kingdom simply could not abide having a voice as legitimate, as knowledgeable, as um, as eloquent as Jamal's, um, talking about their flaws. But the interesting feature of this is Jamal was not a revolutionary. He was not calling for the overthrow of the royal family. He was simply calling for greater freedoms, greater public participation but not in any kind of existential threat to the regime. No, he wanted them to do the right thing. Yeah. That was his constant refrain. Mm -hmm. Kind of wake up and smell the coffee, guys. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot better. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that was published, not the last thing he wrote, but the last thing he published was a critique of Mohammed bin Salman's uh, war in Yemen, was it not? Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I think this was also a reflection of living in Washington and understanding uh, the audience that he was addressing mm -hmm. uh, in the United States and, and in the policy community in Washington. Um, I was a on a panel with him when Mohammed bin Salman came through uh, the United States last year on his grand tour. Staying at Trump properties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, and the war in Yemen is a major concern, as it should be. And the role of the United States in that war was an increasing subject of conversation over the, the preceding couple of years. And so I think Jamal was writing in reflection of the questions he was being asked. My understanding of Ambassador Jordan is that the foreign policy establishment in the, in the US was much more happier with the crown prince, not the deputy crown prince, who was Mohammed bin Salman. He got catapulted over bin Nayef uh, and Ben Naif, I think, is still under house arrest. His fortune's been yeah. confiscated, and he was among the many arrested. So tell us about him and yeah. uh, the extent to which he was Washington's favorite. So why is this guy Trump's favorite? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> Mohammed Ben Naif was the son of Prince Naif bin Abdulaziz, who was the same Minister of Interior I spoke with after 9-11 and who said 9-11 was an Israeli plot. But the son, Mohammed bin Naif, uh, was essentially the person within the Ministry of Interior in charge of fighting terrorism, fighting al-Qaeda at the time I was there as ambassador. So he and I worked very closely together. We probably spoke two or three times a week. Uh, and I stayed in touch with him even after I left office, and particularly during the time I was living in Dubai. Uh, he probably was 
the most effective counterterrorism figure among the Arab Middle East. Uh, and it, I think it was a tragedy that uh, he was elbowed aside so that Mohammed bin Salman could take his place. Uh, but this was the rough and tumble of uh, the way, the, the path that both King Salman and his son uh, chose to elbow aside those who uh, might be a threat to them. Uh, Mohammed bin Nayef is reportedly still under house arrest, uh, still unable to leave the kingdom, uh, but has occasionally appeared in videos with Mohammed bin Salman uh, acknowledging his uh, sovereignty, if you will, uh, and his position, which is, a, I'm sure, something he has been forced into doing. But did the White House play a role in helping him be promoted? That's what I understand. Well, there is there is talk that uh, uh, President Trump gave a green light, or Jared Kushner, who visited Saudi Arabia a very short period before the incarcerations in the Ritz Carlton, uh, may have given a green light uh, for that to occur. There is a connection, apparently, personally, between Kushner and Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, they're roughly the same age. Uh, they see things roughly in the same sort of authoritarian terms. Uh, and uh, this may account for why they have, have been attracted to him. There's also, of course, as, as Tamara was saying earlier, uh, the attraction of an aggressive, young, dynamic leader in the Middle East who appears on the surface to be reforming, to be moving into the 21st century, and to be taking charge of what frankly was a sclerotic, uh, slow-moving, indecisive uh, way of governing that they had in the past. Can I just add a note to that? I mean, speaking from a Washington perspective, um, when President Trump got elected, a lot of America's traditional partners around the world, not just in the Middle East, really didn't know what to do with this guy. And, um, and I think what we saw in the Gulf, both from the Saudis and from the Emiratis, uh, was, OK, well, we know he runs a family business. And we know his family ran his campaign. So let's get close to the family. And I think you know this has been thoroughly reported in the New Yorker and, uh, and the New York Times and a bunch of other places. The degree of investment these governments made in the transition period between November and January in going to New York before they ever got an invitation, you know, banging on the door and getting to know Jared Kushner and Ivanka and the president and anyone else they could in this immediate circle. And, you know, assuming that he was going to run the United States government the way he's run his business, which is as a family business. Um, up until very recently, I think they thought that was a pretty good bet. Uh, they convinced the president and his advisors that that should be where he w would go on his first trip abroad. He went to Riyadh gave them this warm embrace. They rolled out the red carpet. They fed his ego with sword dances and projected his face up on the building. And uh, you know, it was 100% Trump branding in Saudi Arabia. And it, and it worked. Uh, and, and built this personal relationship with Jared Kushner. Now, I think this, they, they, on their end, started to wonder about the value of this investment last month when the president made this sudden surprise decision to withdraw American forces from Syria without consulting with anyone, uh, including them. And they suddenly realized that you can invest all you want in the man, but if the man himself is capricious, then you don't know what you're gonna get. And I think that's where they are now. They're wondering what, what it is they've bought into. Now, on the American side, it's pretty clear that President Trump has put his eggs in the Saudi basket, and not just in the Saudi basket, in the basket of Mohammed bin Salman. Whatever this guy has done, whatever his character may be, whatever his judgment may be, uh, I think that, that President Trump sees the Saudis as um, their, uh, their actor who will do the work so that we don't have to. Uh, 
You've heard things out of the administration that the Saudis are going to put forces into Syria. That's crazy. That is not going to happen. Um, they're perfectly happy to have the Saudis fight a war in Yemen as long as we don't have to get any more deeply involved. Uh, they say the Saudis are going to pay big for the war on ISIS. I'm not sure where that check is getting written to. Um, and they say the Saudis are going to be the ones that are going to make Arab-Israeli peace happen. And, you know, don't... Don't set, that, set your watches by that one. But it's very clear that this, they think this is their strategy and it all hinges on Riyadh. So no matter what this guy does, I don't think they feel like they have another choice. And, and a lot of it is wrapped around a mutual distrust and hatred for Iran, uh, which is the animating factor, I think, in the Saudis' worldview right now and apparently also Trump's view of the Middle East. So it's a good time to write questions up. So we, we want to get quickly to question Q&A. So the, the cards are there, the pencils are there, I take it, and people will come up and grab them. So um, Tamara just mentioned uh, the Saudis not being happy about uh, Trump's moves in Syria, whatever they are. <laughs> I'm sure that we ha it's hard to keep up. Um, but well, you were there when my understanding is they were not happy about the U.S. going into Iraq. Didn't they counsel George W. Bush against it? Yes and no. <clears throat> uh, their public position was very much opposed to it, uh, I think, and privately they both uh, said to the president and to me that uh, we might win the war, but we likely would not win the peace. Uh, we didn't know what to do on the day after uh, an invasion. Of course, they turned out to be right. Um, but uh, I was actually, a, the president asked me to be his point person in getting Saudi cooperation, which we very much needed in connection with the invasion. So we needed their assistance in border crossings, uh, in uh, use of their air bases, uh, in uh, frankly cover with the Muslim world, uh, and uh, a number of other uh, intelligence related activities, all of which by the way they gave us. Uh, I then went to see King Abdullah uh, about a year later, after things had started heading south, and I said, thank you, Your Majesty, for not saying I told you so. <laughs> and he sort of smiled in, in kind of a knowing smile, and that's sort of exactly what he was thinking, though. They had certainly told us we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we didn't believe them. Our leadership didn't. Uh, and so we ended up where we did. So that gets to the the bigger question, and your colleague at the Council of Foreign Relations, Stephen Cook, said, we, we in the United States have a kind of mystical idea that, that Saudi Arabia is a great American asset, when in fact he argues they're a, more of a headache. How do you look at the whole world in terms of Wahhabism spreading around the world? Do you, you know, even in Boko Haram, you can list them all, the Islamic sure. State, all of these people who've taken inspiration from Wahhabism. I think it's a very serious problem, and one that I've addressed a lot in the last uh, few years. Uh, I had these hopes uh, when I was there uh, that the Saudis would come into the 21st century. Uh, my main objective was to get them into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, so they would be part of the family of nations, that they would uh, learn to cooperate with uh, Western-style democracies and Western-style economies. And to some degree, that was successful. They went from the 56th largest economy to the 19th largest economy and became part of the G20. And so from an economic standpoint and a business standpoint, they did move into that area. But by the same token, they still have made no progress in the dissemination of this hateful propaganda through Wahhabi Islam. If you look at the textbooks they send around the world, those books still compare Jews to monkeys. Uh, they still talk about fighting jihad. Uh, and they are uh, subsidizing madrasas and, and mosques in South Asia, Indonesia, and they're actually elbowing aside many of the more moderate uh, imams and, and uh, communities there uh, with this more radical form of Islam. And so they've done very little to stop spreading it, even though uh, Crown Prince Mohammed uh, has professed to say that he is taking Saudi back to a more moderate form of Islam. Um, I don't know what he means by that, but we haven't seen evidence, at least in uh, their international activities. Yeah, and I think we actually haven't seen evidence in their domestic yeah. activities either. Um, one initiative that, that the administration you served undertook, I think after you left 
Riyadh was a, a set of dialogues, part of a strategic dialogue with the kingdom, and we had a working group together where we talked about some of this incendiary uh, content in Saudi textbooks, and they made commitments to reform. Um, a study just came out from a, a colleague of mine who tracks this stuff, and the textbooks are unchanged. The latest textbooks include all the same stuff. Uh, you know, Mohammed bin Salman has been crown prince now for long enough. Yeah. If he wanted to do this stuff, it would be done. Right. So let's go to a question here. Uh, for you, uh, Tamara, if you were to advise women in Saudi Arabia how to increase their rights, what would you recommend? Um, far be it from me to advise <laughs> Saudi women who are some of the toughest, most creative and persistent uh, women I have come across doing this work. Um, there are women all over the kingdom uh, working in their own communities on issues from environmental protection to um, uh, rights of the disabled to encouraging women to register as voters and candidates in these municipal council elections, driving activists. Um, they are incredible. And, uh, and I think that they already are creating change in the ways that they can. But they are atomized across the kingdom there is no legal civil society. You can't legally start an NGO in the kingdom. And so they have to do this informally, and they do it knowing that on any given day, they could have a knock on the door uh, and be arrested. And a number of them have been arrested uh, in the past year, including a, a good friend of mine who has been in detention since June. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I cannot give them advice what risks they should be willing to take in these circumstances. What I can say is that the demographics and the economics of Saudi Arabia today um, are creating their own pressures for change. Saudi society is changing. And the question in my mind is whether the government recognizes that and can keep up with it and can um, mobilize and, and learn from and gain from the potential of this dynamic society. It's already a society where a one income family can't live very comfortably and you need two incomes to have a good upper middle class life and build a home and all that kind of stuff. So there's already a tremendous premium put in Saudi families on having young women who are educated, capable of getting good jobs, raising their kids to get a good education. Um, it's a question of whether the government is willing to give space for this. So here's a question uh, to Ambassador Jordan. At the time of the invasion of Iraq, what was your perspective on why we were invading? That's, a, that's an excellent and important question. Uh, Undoubtedly, uh, the instructions and the information that I received was that Saddam was developing chemical and biological weapons. I saw no evidence that he was developing nuclear weapons, but I did see intelligence reports, intercepts, for example, of Iraqi military officers, one of them saying to the other, do you have a gas mask? When you have your gas mask ready because uh, when the shooting starts, you're going to need it. And so these were things, and some of the intelligence obviously was flawed. Uh, some of it was uh, perhaps artificially created. But uh, I have no doubt that, by the way, not created by our own government, but fed to us, I think, by supposedly uh, reliable sources. Uh, in hindsight, of course, it was a colossal mistake, but I think it was a mistake of misunderstanding and bad information rather than any intentional mistake or an intentional act on the part of our government. Uh, as it became clear that Saddam uh, did not, at least they weren't, we weren't finding uh, chemical and biological weapons, the narrative changed. And the narrative changed to be something in which we would hold out uh, Iraq uh, as a model democracy, particularly a model that the Saudis might be encouraged to emulate. Uh, and so uh, this, of course, in hindsight also seems laughable. I understand the laughter. Uh, 
but it, it was something that was going on heavily at that time. There was something, I know tomorrow you were actually involved to some degree in this Middle East Partnership Initiative, and that was a, a pro-democracy kind of effort. And it was led by, of all people during my time, uh, by the vice president's daughter, Liz Cheney, who is now in Congress. And I would have these arguments with Liz, uh, and I would say, Liz, you can't use the D word in the Middle East. Democracy is not a word that you can use there right now. And she said, oh, you're wrong, Bob. You're wrong. You're wrong. Democracy is our brand, and we have to promote democracy in the Middle East. So there was a strong element of that going on uh, in the White House uh, in Washington during that period of time. But from my perspective, it was all about weapons of mass destruction uh, at the time we went in. So a question for you tomorrow. Would Qatar have been blockaded without Trump's visit? How will when the Qatar blockade end and will Wahhabi uh, international schools shrink? Uh, okay, well, on Qatar, this dispute um, between the Saudis and Emiratis and Egyptians and Bahrainis on the one hand and the Qataris on the other didn't, didn't start in 2017. It actually started well before. And the round one was in 2014. It was actually <laughs> 2002. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was, uh, in some ways you can date this all the way back to uh, when the father of the current Qatari emir took power from his father uh, with a little bit of help from the Saudis. So some of this is uh, inter-family inter uh, relationships in the Gulf that go back a long, long way. Um, but the most recent round, I think, really was an outgrowth of the political environment in the region after the Arab uprisings, when the Saudis and Emiratis in particular saw um, Muslim Brotherhood-affiliated political movements uh, gaining strength and prominence all around the region. And, it, and the Qataris, uh, through Al Jazeera, their uh, pan-Arab satellite channel, giving the Muslim Brotherhood a lot of space and a lot of platform. And the Saudis and Emiratis see the Brotherhood as an existential threat. Um, and so they simply could not abide this. This was a fundamental argument between these different states in the Gulf about the trajectory of the region and what was acceptable and what was beyond the pale. And they have not resolved that dispute. They are still in a fierce battle that is being fought out with money all across the Middle East, in Libya and in Syria and elsewhere, about whether the Muslim Brotherhood is, is within the fold of acceptable for the Arab future of the Arab world, or you know, uh, terrorists who are bent on overthrowing us. Um, and now Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is involved in this as well. He came to the Qatari's defense. So in other words, this is a very deep-seated argument. Uh, it didn't take Trump to kick it off. I don't think he necessarily gave it a green light, or if he did, he probably had no idea what he was doing. Uh, because this is a little beyond the the level that they that they seem to take to look at well, these supposedly things. Supposedly, he didn't know that we had that huge base there. Right, <laughs> right. What, are, what what is this place anyway? Right, um, the largest I, military base in the Middle East. Right, <laughs> and apparently he he told his briefers in the intelligence community that uh, Nepal and Bhutan were uh, were part of China. So there you go. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't think Trump made this happen or didn't, you know, could have prevented it. And I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. I think, unfortunately, it might get papered over a bit. But this, this disagreement is here to stay. Question for you, Ambassador. After Khashoggi's murder, what are the odds Mohammed bin Salman will face consequences under the Magnitsky Act? Uh, Mohammed bin Salman personally likely will never face consequences under the Global Magnitsky Act. Uh, he may be uh, prohibited from visiting the United States under the most extreme interpretation of that, which simply means he can't come here and go to Disneyland. But uh, I think he is probably going to escape uh, any personal sanctions. Uh, I think we will potentially see uh, the Senate especially uh, deal with the Magnitsky Act uh, this spring. Uh, I think we may see other consequences for Saudi Arabia, such as uh, our Congress's refusal to certify under what's called the 123 section uh, of uh, the Defense uh, Authorization Act, uh, which would 
deny them access to American technology for peaceful nuclear purposes. Uh, they want to build nuclear reactors. Uh, they've announced plans to do so with South Korean consultants, uh, but they need our help uh, through uh, the 123 agreement, which, by the way, the Emiratis have agreed to. But the Saudis are uh, refusing to agree to certain parts of that, and I think we may see some enforcement along those lines, perhaps more effectively than the Magnitsky Act. But I do think the Magnitsky Act can apply to other uh, Saudis besides uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and hopefully it reaches up to some of the people such as this fellow uh, Katani, who appears not even to be uh, being prosecuted uh, within Saudi Arabia. The, uh, the report that the administration is required to give to Congress under the Magnitsky legislation is due to Congress, I believe, n this week. It's a four-month trigger, yeah. It's a four-month trigger. So, so we should see this week what the administration is willing to tell Congress about its understanding of who is responsible for this murder. So here's a good one. Do you suspect that the kingdom has spies monitoring this talk right now? Ahlan wa sahlan. Translate. I, you're, you're most welcome. welcome. We're on the record. I have nothing to hide. <laughs> All right. So, uh, this just don't go to the Turkish consulate. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me ask the ambassador, do you see a future of Saudi Arabia and what uh, does this uh, 2020 vision represent or amount to? Yeah, it's vision 2030. 20, 2030. Uh, 2030. Yes. 2030. Uh, Vision 2030 is a very ambitious plan uh, authored uh, largely by the McKinsey consulting firm. They have sold various versions of that to many Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and it aims to wean the Saudis off dependence on oil, diversify their economy, uh, provide uh, jobs uh, for the hundreds of thousands of young Saudis who are getting out of school and needing jobs. Uh, and it is a very ambitious plan that has virtually no chance of succeeding, at least within the four corners of the document. Um, its, its linchpin was to be a public offering for 5% of Aramco, uh, which they valued, a valued Aramco at $2 trillion, and so they valued this as about a $100 billion venture. Well, they have been unable to go forward with that IPO, uh, largely because they don't want to engage in the kind of disclosure that the regulators and financial uh, exchanges uh, would require. And so that's on hold. Uh, they can't fund a lot of these projects that are going to be public finance primed uh, to en uh, en enlist the private sector to join in. Uh, so I think we're not likely to see that. We're also not seeing uh, sufficient uh, education for the population to undertake the kind of jobs that they need to undertake. Right now, the public sector pays 70% more in salaries than the private sector does in Saudi Arabia. Uh, no person in their right mind is going to turn down that kind of a job opportunity. So they've got to figure out how to feather back on the subsidies. They subsidize gasoline, they subsidize uh, utilities, water, uh, and they don't have, of course, any kind of income tax. They've added a value-added tax. Uh, which uh, is not going to provide that much financing. So the entire financial uh, basis for the plan, I think, is quite suspect. Uh, I think they may uh, make uh, marginal uh, improvements here and there, but uh, if you look at the document itself, they're going to need to come out with a Vision 30, 2030 uh, 1 or 2.0 uh, before it's going to be realistic. So since we're talking about tilting at windmills and chimeras. <laughs> what about Jared's plan? I mean, we know there's a de, fa de facto, uh, some kind of a de facto relationship or alliance perhaps with um, Sisi in Egypt, Netanyahu in Israel, and Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. But is there less that meets the eye to that? Or what do you say? Boy, I, I feel like this is, um, it's impossible to know actually, what the substance of this uh, peace plan is, if it has substance. Um, every time uh, one of us in a think tank or 
um, visiting from Israel or somewhere else in the region comes to Washington and says to someone in the administration, well, you know, how can you do this and this in the peace plan? They say, oh, no, no, that's not the peace plan. And so they, they'll tell us constantly what is not part of the peace plan or what's wrong about what we think is in the peace plan, but nobody is willing to say what is in this peace plan. Um, I, I think after 20 years banging my head against the Arab-Israeli conflict, I think that a serious basis for negotiation has to include certain obvious elements, and it has to address the final status issues that were left to the end of the Oslo process and are unaddressed, which include the status of Jerusalem, borders, settlements, and refugees. Okay, Any peace plan that doesn't propose a way forward on those four issues doesn't get us to peace. It might get us somewhere else, but it doesn't get us to peace. And, um, and I have not seen from Trump administration policy what they've actually done, any willingness to seriously reckon with those four issues. They prejudged the outcome on Jerusalem. In fact, the president said he took it off the table. They prejudged the outcome on refugees, and some in the administration have said they've taken that off the table. Uh, and, you know, and then you have borders and settlements where you've seen absolutely no inclination by the Trump administration to seriously grapple with those issues. So forgive me if I'm cynical, about the prospects of their actually producing a plan that could be a basis for peace. Now, could they cook up something else that sort of goes around the, the issues in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Could they cook up something like uh, a strategic partnership between certain Arab states and Israel to work together in intelligence cooperation against Iran and Hezbollah? Sure. But let's not call that an Arab-Israeli peace plan. So, Ambassador Jordan, uh, let me combine two questions here. Why would a smart, worldly journalist like Shoji expose himself to such dangers? And what is the future of Saudi relations with Turkey? Jamal did expose himself to danger by going to Turkey. He had apparently been assured by the Saudi ambassador to the United States, who happens to be the son of the king and the brother of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, that he would be safe if he went to the consulate in Turkey to get uh, the divorce papers he needed so that he could then marry uh, his fiance, his Turkish fiance. Uh, he may have been a bit naive in that regard, uh, but I think he probably felt safe in Turkey, partly because Turkey... Uh, has to a degree an adversarial relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I suspect he felt that no, uh, no one would be crazy enough uh, to attempt uh, uh, anything against him uh, with, on Turkish soil. Uh, certainly Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has reacted very negatively uh, in the aftermath. Uh, the future of United States relations with Turkey, I think, is, is a huge question mark. Uh, they are a regional rival to the Saudis, yet they are a member of NATO. At the same time, they're proposing to purchase a, a missile defense system from the Russians, which makes very little sense for a NATO ally. Uh, that missile defense system is designed to shoot down F-35 American airplanes. Uh, and so, uh, it's a, as they say, it's complicated. Uh, Turkey has uh, an important economy in the region. They have the second largest uh, army in NATO, uh, and so they are a force to be at least taken a into account. Uh, Erdogan is an uh, authoritarian thug uh, who has become more thuggish over the years, uh, and yet uh, because of the string of alliances that we have, uh, we can't simply walk away from it. So we've got to manage it. Uh, we've got to throttle it up and down depending on what our interests are. And as Tamara accurately pointed out at the beginning, we don't have permanent friends. We have permanent interests, and those interests can shift over time, as I think they're doing right now. A question about the Pope having just arrived in the U UAE. What influence may the multi-millennium old Catholic institution have on swaying Mohammed bin Salman to end the Yemen disaster? 
I mean, the UAE is in Yemen as along with Saudi Arabia, so. Yes, the, the Emiratis are in Yemen along with Saudi Arabia. And um, one of the challenges in an earlier phase of, uh, of attempted mediation of this conflict is that uh, the Emiratis, who are even harder over on the Muslim Brotherhood than the Saudis, did not want to include in the, uh, in the negotiations Islah, which is one of the major parties in Yemen and is a Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement. I, I understand the Emiratis have now softened on that, and Islam is part of the uh, the talks that are ongoing. Um, so that's a step forward. Uh, I've, you know, look, the Pope um, in his global role is primarily a, a moral voice. He's not a political voice. Um, what the Gulf states want from this visit is to showcase in the Emirates um, the way in which they are open and tolerant and allow freedom of religion. Uh, and they want the Pope there as a manifestation of that and also to sort of give it his blessing, if you will, um, and to give, give that a moment on the world stage through him. So if he could use this visit also to shine a spotlight on the humanitarian nightmare that is the war in Yemen, um, I think that is a very good uh, use of the platform that he has. Um, the, the end of this war will come not only when the Saudis and Emiratis want it to end, uh, but also when they, they can broker an effective uh, coalition government uh, in Yemen that will include uh, all the guys who have been fighting. That is a very expensive endeavor. <laughs> I, don't think, um, I don't think there has been effective peace in Yemen in the last several decades that hasn't been subsidized by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, if we're being honest. And I think that will be the case here as well. I should add that there is a really good op-ed piece in Politico yesterday or today written by Yusuf Alateba, who is the UAE ambassador to the United States, talking about the Pope's visit, how important it is, how important it is to be more pluralistic in approaches to religion and how the extremists uh, should not capture the dialogue or capture this, the spotlight uh, and exclude other religions. I've been to Christian church services uh, in uh, the UAE. Uh, they do have uh, churches there, very much unlike Saudi Arabia. So... Let's get through a few more here as we're getting close to the ending. Are there financial business ties between the Trump Organization and the Saudis? I have no idea. Yep, we don't know. And we still don't have the president's tax returns, so we also don't know who he owes money to. If the United States becomes energy independent, do you think that will help equalize the leverage that Saudi Arabia holds over them, I mean, I guess over us. Well, we effectively are energy independent already. We still import somewhere around 9 million barrels a day of a unique form of Arab crude that we need for certain of our refineries here in the United States. Uh, Saudi Arabia is no longer the swing producer in the world. It's the United States. And so if the price uh, of oil is high enough, our uh, U.S. shale producers especially are capable of uh, producing uh, certainly more than we need to consume in the United States and developing uh, an increasing export business, uh, both in oil and ultimately perhaps natural gas through LNG. So I think this is already part of the calculus in how we look at Saudi Arabia. We need them much less now than we did 30 years ago, and they don't seem to quite realize that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I'll, I'll just add two points. One is that the importance of Saudi Arabia to the United States in terms of oil prices, it's not just about what we buy or what the price is here. It's about the global market. And so it's that role as swing producer that let the Saudis be so influential in setting the global price and in and the Chinese and the Europeans who are still buying a lot from the Saudis are... Uh, 
are concerned about that, and they're our main trading partners. So the Saudi role goes beyond what we buy from them or what we use here. It really, it's, it's a global market. And because of shale production and because of other new supplies around the globe, West Africa and so on, um, the Saudi, the Saudi uh, production is not as dominant in the market and they can't set prices the way they used to for, for the world market. So, um, so all of that, I think, in theory, gives us more flexibility. Uh, but in practice, we got to want to use it. Why don't we stop arms sales to the Saudis? Beats me. <laughs> uh, I, I would say this. Um, there is zero chance that if we said tomorrow we're no longer, at least for the moment, going to sell you F-15s, the Saudis would miraculously overnight go to Russia or China. Uh, they simply can't do that. Uh, these uh, pieces of equipment have to be interoperable with many other systems, computers, training, all sorts of things that would literally take years for them to replace. Uh, so I do think we have some leverage in that regard. Uh, I also do think that uh, the relationship of arms sales to any country, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, should not be determined by simply the volume of those sales. Uh, that creates a moral hazard, I think, and I think it creates uh, a complete distortion of what uh, our relationships around the world in arms sales ought to be. We do want the Saudis to be able to take more responsibility for their own security. We want them to be able to fly F-15s without crashing a bunch of them like they continually do. Uh, we want them to have a viable army. Uh, we want them to be able to police their own neighborhood much more effectively. And so I think that has to motivate a lot of how we view our arms sales and our technical assistance, our training, uh, and it also does allow for a closer uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, but it also allows us to use that as a lever, uh, as a means of, of leverage in discussions that we have about Yemen uh, or that we have about Qatar. Well, let me ask the last question, if I may. <laughs> um, we recently learned that uh, the National Security Advisor, John Bolton, has tasked the Joint Chiefs of Staff with a war plan against Iran. My understanding would be that any kind of war in that very, very volatile region, particularly with those narrow Straits of Hormuz with the IRGC speedboats buzzing about, it wouldn't take much to sink a couple of tankers, close off the Gulf, Obviously, the price of oil would go through the ceiling. It wouldn't help Iran. It wouldn't help Saudi Arabia. It would, would help Russia. I mean, notwithstanding the possibility of an act of stupidity, what do you think we can... Do you think something's going to happen in the next year? Or is this just bluster? Because we know that both Netanyahu and, and Mohammed bin Salman are pretty hawkish and they're pushing behind the scenes. For what, I don't know. So John Bolton's views on Iran are clear. He has a very long track record that he brought with him into office. Um, I think you're correct to say that Mohammed bin Salman is not only um, very hostile to Iran, but has demonstrated a, an aggressive streak and a risk tolerance, I think. So I don't exclude the possibility for some kind of um, uh, unintended escalation, you know, or an Iranian speedboat that gets a little closer than it intends to, and it, you know, our beautiful it, ship, as the president said, right, our beautiful ship. So, you know, yes, that could happen, but I don't take the fact that the that uh, the Pentagon was instructed, if in fact it was instructed, to produce war plans in and of itself as an indicator of intentions. It's the Pentagon's job to be prepared for all kinds of eventualities. We had sanctions on the Iranians. We're hoping to get them to the table on the nuclear program. They were progressing with their nuclear development. You know, that took years. We were negotiating with them over the JCPOA for years. It would have been irresponsible during that period not to have had options available if we felt that we needed to preempt an Iranian nuclear weapons capability. That's the Pentagon's job. So in and of itself, that doesn't trouble me. Um, and, and frankly, I think the president's own inclinations are, are very much to stay out of wars. He seems to really resent uh, the deployment of American forces abroad, even when they're there to prevent wars. 
So I, I'm not worried about a drive toward conflict. I am worried about unexpected incidents that blow up into crises because we have people both here and in the region who are not well equipped to handle them. And for once we'd have a real crisis as opposed to manufactured crises. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm being editorial. I know. Yes, yeah, that w those were your words. We had a, a similar confluence of moving parts and anxieties and misunderstood intentions, and it caused something called World War I. So what's your prognosis, sir? just in a quick closing? I, I think it's going to be a dangerous situation. I, my, my hope and guess is that it doesn't lead to a complete conflagration. There may well be uh, a, occasional uh, fire fights here and there, I mean, I can recall uh, the USS Pueblo, which was uh, uh, something that I was involved in when I was a naval officer uh, that was uh, captured uh, uh, and ultimately released. But we've had uh, other uh, incidents at sea that, have, that could have led to uh, a much stronger confrontation that we somehow managed. My hope is we can manage whatever uh, accident might occur, uh, but we've got to be careful about the rhetoric. Well, again, Ambassador Jordan's book, Desert Diplomat, is available up in, in the um, foyer. And I thank both Tamara Widders and Ambassador Jordan for coming. And thank you all. <laughs>